Good morning, metalheads of the internet, and welcome to a new episode of The Metal Meltdown by semi-popular demand, and because there aren't a lot of other albums I really want to talk about this week, we are going to review every single Metallica album ever made. Arguably the definitive metal band, a band as important to the evolution and history of this genre and of rock music as Black Sabbath, Iron Maiden, Judas Priest, and any other fucking band you could probably name right fucking now. Quite a big task for sure, so let's not waste any time. Let's get right the fuck into it. Oh, and yes, the birthday decorations are still up, so feel free to keep leaving happy birthday messages for Moose, I guess. Uh, or don't. I, I don't care. Let's talk about Metallica. <laughs> Now, in the last 40 years, this band hasn't put out nearly as many records as Iron Maiden, Black Sabbath, or Judas Priest. They've only put out 10 regular studio albums, so to beef up this video a little bit, we are also going to look at the band's cover and compilation record, Garage Inc., the band's two collaborations with the San Francisco Symphony Orchestra, s and 1 and 2, and yes, their highly controversial collaboration with the one and only Lou Reed. Which would unfortunately end up being the last album that that man made while he was alive. Ah! Oh. But hey, we will address that particular elephant in the room when we approach it. For now, let's start with the band's debut album, Kill 'Em All. Released July 25th, 1983, Kill 'Em All shows the band at their most savage, their most primal, their most bloodthirsty and brutish. The refinement and maturity that we would eventually come to expect from Metallica is nowhere to be found on this particular album, but that's kind of why it's still such a great record. There are few records that feel as fucking evil and nasty and ferocious as Kill 'Em All. From start to finish, this thing is nasty, in-your-face, hyper-provocative, hyper-extreme, street punk, fury and brutality. Razor-sharp guitar work, pummeling percussion, some truly evil fucking vocals from an extremely young James Hetfield really letting his punk flag fly across this thing, resulting in some of the band's most entertaining and engaging tracks to this day. I mean, Jump in the Fire is still incredibly catchy. Four Horsemen is still incredibly catchy. Seek and Destroy, still incredibly fucking catchy. If you don't want to start a fucking mosh pit the moment Hit the Light starts, there's something, like, actually wrong with you. Like, something mentally wrong with you. I'm not even saying that to be crude. I think you need to go see a doctor. The absolutely disgusting, otherworldly bass and percussion on Anesthesia Pulling Teeth continues to be as mind-blowing today as it was in 1983. No one's ever really said it. I'm gonna go ahead and say it. This song is really is thrash metal's answer to something like Eruption. It's just a great fucking record. Maybe not the band's most intelligent, but nonetheless thoroughly entertaining. I'm gonna give this thing a 4 out of 5. Honestly, kind of a perfect little time capsule of everything that made Metallica and early American thrash metal so great in this time. It's mean, dumb, greasy, and stupid for all the right reasons, like some kind of glorious old school thrash and speed metal cheeseburger. One that I continue to enjoy to this very day. Four to five, a seriously fucking great record. Next up is Ride the Lightning, released almost exactly a year later on July 27th, 1984. James, Lars, Kirk, and Cliff have clearly learned from the successes and the failures of Kill 'Em All on Ride the Lightning. It is every bit as gigantic, every bit as evil, every bit as ferocious, but it's also a lot more mature. It's also a lot more progressive and even, dare I say, professional. The production value is way better on this thing, the musicianship is way tighter on this thing, and the songs are a lot more unique and ambitious 
than what would be expected of heavy and thrash metal of that time. Take for instance the track Fade to Black, a number that shows the band who at the time were portrayed as a very muscular, masculine, true American metal band at a much more emotionally vulnerable and transparent place than anyone could have possibly predicted or expected. Or for instance, the band's absolutely massive instrumental number, The Call of Cthulhu, which remains one of their most dynamic, epic, and thunderous tracks. Even tracks that seem to fall in line with what is expected from Metallica of that time are extremely wild and unpredictable. Take for instance Fight Fire with Fire, arguably one of the band's most sonically extreme and punishing cuts ever or the incredibly doomy, almost apocalyptic draws of For Whom the Bell Tolls. Like, I'm pretty certain that when the world ends, that is the song that will be bursting down from the heavens themselves. It is that fucking evil. For a long time, this actually was my favorite Metallica album, and for that reason, I'm sure some of you are expecting a 5 out of 5. But, I can't do that because of a little track called Escape. It's by no means a terrible track, it's just nowhere near as exciting and engaging as literally every other moment of this record. Even Metallica have made it pretty clear. They aren't huge fans of this particular track, and it was pretty much just thrown in as literal filler. But hey, 7 out of 8 is a pretty fucking incredible score. Like, if I got 7 out of 8 on a test, I'd, I'd, I'd feel pretty good about that. So with that in mind, I'm giving this a 4.5 out of 5. I, I fucking love this record, man. Just fucking fantastic. Not that I think I need to tell any of you, because, you know, they're fucking Metallica, but I'll say it again regardless. Fucking fantastic. Next up, it's The Big Boy, ladies and gentlemen. An album that some would argue is the greatest metal album of all time. Master of Puppets, released March 3rd, 1986. And, uh, yeah, I, I don't really have anything to add on to that. I mean, <sighs> what a fucking masterpiece of a record. Now, I will admit, I might be a little biased in regards to this particular album. Not only was this the first Metallica album I ever listened to, this was one of the first metal albums I ever bought with my own money. Simply put, it takes everything that made Ride the Lightning so successful, so powerful, so expansive, and so ambitious, and amplifies it to fucking 11. It's louder, it's meaner, it's darker, it's more intelligent, it's more powerful, it's more, more. More good, more great, more incredible, more everything. And it is a fucking masterpiece for it. Some of the band's best songs ever, some of the band's best production ever, the band's best lyrics ever, the band's best performances ever. Battery remains an absolute battering of my mind, body, and soul. Title track Master of Puppets remains one of the most anthemic and engaging tracks that heavy metal has ever dared to unleash upon this earth. The Thing That Should Not Be, Welcome Home, Orion, Disposable Heroes, all just absolute fucking bangers, dude. Look, let's cut the bullshit. I think you all know where I'm going with this. Five out of five. A fucking perfect record. A masterpiece of heavy metal, of thrash metal, of rock music. It is just such an amazing earth-shattering record. To the point where I am like this close to just stopping this video and listening to this album from start to fucking finish all over again. Look, there's a good chance you've already heard this album at some point in your life at least once, but just in case you haven't, go fucking do it, dude! What the fuck are you waiting for? Next up, the band's fourth studio album, And Justice For All, released September 7th, 1988. And I'm gonna try and do the impossible here. I don't know if this has ever been done before. I am going to attempt to review this record without mentioning Jason Newstead's absolute lack of a performance on this record. Why? Because it's simple, ladies and gentlemen. I've no interest in continuing to beat this dead horse to an utter fucking pulp. We are all well aware that there is no fucking bass to be found whatsoever on this album. Let's move on. Let's focus on the songwriting. Let's focus on the maturity of the record. And let's focus how Metallica has evolved as a band on this album. Because that is ultimately what fucking 
matters and that is ultimately why this record is still as powerful today as it was in this time. Hands down one of the band's most musically ambitious records, period. More super technical, surgically precise musicianship, and more progressive influence, some very dark, hyper-realistic lyrics across this album, some pulling from real-life events, reflecting on the band's real-life experiences with loss and depression. I mean, sure, some of these elements were definitely present on other records, particularly the title track from Master of Puppets, but my god, is it all the more fucking potent and poignant on here. From the ominous, chunky, technical thrash of Harvester of Sorrow to the hyper-provocative extremity of Blackened and Dyer's Eve, to the band's truly iconic Grammy award-winning track, One. An absolutely devastating and gut-wrenching number with incredible vocals, an absolutely devastating and gut-wrenching number with some incredible vocals, some of the band's most inventive guitar work maybe, like, ever. The final few minutes of this track remain every bit as terrifying and exhilarating now as they were back in 1988. I still remember the first time I ever listened to this song, I was genuinely pretty fucking scared of this. A seriously great record with a pretty unique sound, regardless of how we got to that unique sound, I'd feel very comfortable giving this a 4 out of 5. I would feel more comfortable giving it a higher score if there was more bass in the sound, just throwing that out there. But as it stands, it is a remarkable fucking record with some seriously fantastic songwriting, some seriously fantastic atmosphere and musicianship. What more can I really say, folks? Four to five, a great record. Leave the dead horse alone. It's dead. It's not getting back up. Just enjoy the album for what it is. And this now brings us to easily the band's most famous and commercially successful record ever. Their self-titled album Metallica, more commonly referred to as The Black Album, released August 12, 1991. Wah, they sold out after this album. Wah, they're not playing thrash metal anymore. Wah, they're, they're famous now. They sold out. Wah! Cry all you want, ladies and gentlemen. The fact remains, this is one of the most critically acclaimed and commercially successful records ever fucking made. This album made the band the household names that they are today. For fuck's sakes, it still sells 5,000 copies every fucking week. That is utterly insane. And the reason for that astounding success is very simple, ladies and gentlemen. This is a seriously great fucking record. It just does such a consistently great job at throwing out heavy, raucous, in-your-face heavy metal with an accessible and melodic flair from tracks like Holier Than Thou to Sad But True to Wherever I May Roam to Through the Never to truly iconic cuts like Nothing Else Matters and the one and only Enter Sandman. Yes, it is arguably one of the most overplayed fucking tracks in history. But it's still a motherfucking banger! They sold out! Yeah, yeah. Pull a fucking stick out of your ass, dude. I don't give a fuck how mainstream something is. Just like I don't care how fucking underground something is. I care if the album is fucking good. And not only is this good, but it's fucking great. Four out of five. Fucking great record. Fucking fantastic. God, I cannot wait to respond to all the salty ass fucking thrash metal nerds and elitists. Oh, that's gonna be fun. That's gonna be really fucking fun. Next up is the band's sixth studio album, Load, released June 6, 1994. And, um... This is where me and Metallica begin to part ways a little bit. Clearly inspired by the astounding success of the Black Album, Load begins to trade out some of the heavier influences for some more traditional hard rock blues and alternative rock influences. With bigger hooks, bigger melodies, cleaner production, less frantic, over-the-top guitar wizardry, and more traditional rock and roll songwriting. First time I ever heard this album, I'll admit it, I, I fucking hated it. I was just like, this isn't Master of Puppets. This isn't Kill em All. Where's my thrash metal? <sighs> and frankly, even now, I find some of these tracks to be, um, irritating at best, shall we say. The Diet Motley Crue-esque butt rock of Ain't My Bitch remains to be an incredibly, uh, 
cringe-worthy moment for the band, in my opinion. But overall, I have come to appreciate this album a lot more as I've grown older. I've come to appreciate tracks like The Outlaw Torn, like Until It Sleeps, like King Nothing. I've even come to appreciate and enjoy the country-tinged ballad of Mama Said, which probably has one of James Hetfield's best vocal performances, if we're being honest, at least of this era. For me, the issue isn't that it's objectively less metal than previous records. The biggest issue is that half the album just isn't really up to par. There are a lot of tracks that I think are just really kind of generic and forgettable and aren't quite as strong as some of the tracks we've just mentioned. Like, honestly, I think you could literally cut off half this fucking album and not only would you not lose anything, but I think you'd have a much more tight and cohesive record from start to finish. I think they were so excited by the success of the Black Album that they just never really felt the need to restrain themselves. They just kind of said, fuck it, let's just write a bunch of really fun, catchy rock songs. And unfortunately, because of that, there is a lot of inconsistency in quality across the album. But you know, all things considered, I'd maybe give it a 2.5 out of 5. A, a pretty damn enthusiastic one at that. Like, if I were to describe this to somebody, I wouldn't go, eh, you know, it's okay. I would say something more like, hey, you know what? It's okay. Check it out. It's probably not going to win over the elitists who are still crying and moaning because the band sold out. But, uh, pfft, fuck them. I don't care. Metallica sure as hell doesn't care. So why should you fucking care? Give it a shot. Who knows? Maybe you'll end up enjoying it. Next up is Reload, released November 18th, 1997. It's never been entirely clear to me where Reload stands in the band's discography, to be honest. Like, is it supposed to be like a collection of tracks that were cut off of Load? Is it supposed to be the second part of a double album? Is it supposed to be a sequel or a spiritual successor? I'm not really sure. Here's what I do know. It's pretty fucking weak. There are a couple jams on here, like the fan favorite Fuel, which remains a pretty stupid but ultimately entertaining kind of butt rock jam, but... Yeah, other than that, there's nothing especially memorable or exciting about this album. It's just a collection of really dry and uninspired hard rock. At best, it feels like the reheated leftovers of Load, and at worst, it is genuinely pretty fucking stupid. Cough, cough, the track Devil's Dance. Cough, cough, it sounds like Alice in Chains trying to write a really sexy fucking rock song. Cough, cough. Oh, that's a weird cold. I gotta get that checked out. Yeah, I'd probably give this a 1.5 out of 5. I, I honestly think it's a pretty bad record. Not because they sold out and then they cut their hair. I Again, I don't give a fuck about that shit. I just don't really think it's up to par. Maybe sandwiched somewhere between Load and Reload, there's potential for one really great late 90s rock record. But, you know, there's there's really no point wasting our time on hypotheticals. Reload just isn't up to par. Not in my opinion, at least. Next up is Garage Inc., released November 24th, 1998. I'll give the band credit where it's due. It's genuinely nice to see them actively try and transform some of these songs into something different, into something unique for Metallica, particularly when they begin to wander into more country territory. Take, for instance, on their covers of Tuesday's Gone and Turn the Page from Leonard Skinner and Bob Seger, respectively. The latter of which I would argue is one of the band's most underrated cuts, period. But man, there are some dumb fucking songs on here. Like, really legitimately stupid fucking songs. Take, for instance, the track Sabra Cadabra. The jazzy, bluesy, boogie swing and soul of this track just does not work with Metallica's inherently gritty hard rock presentation. It just fucking doesn't. Then there's It's Electric, which is just a really fucking dumb, boring-ass, white trash, biker rock song. Ugh, I hate it. But the worst offender is easily Whiskey in the Jar. Not only is it the worst song on this album, it is one of the worst songs Metallica have ever fucking made. It's got one of their ugliest fucking riffs, one of their ugliest fucking choruses, just an all-around ugly, awkward, cringe-worthy fucking mess. I'd give this thing a two. It's a really clumsy and, and, and messy record. It's ultimately only saved by the few tracks that it has that are really fucking good, like some of the ones we've mentioned, as well as their cover of Am I Evil. By no means their worst album, but make no mistake, it has some of their worst fucking material. 
ever. Next up, S&M, released November 23rd, 1999. This is the band's first collaboration with the San Francisco Symphony Orchestra. On this album, the two entities work together in a live setting to transform some of the band's most iconic material into outright symphonic metal, complete with horns, strings, flute, keyboards, classical percussion and presentation, and so much more. The result is, you guessed it, pretty inconsistent. Ironically, at this point in Metallica's career, the only thing they are consistently good at is making very inconsistent fucking records. There are definitely some highlights on here. The new versions of For Whom the Bell Tolls and Nothing Else Matters in particular are absolutely stunning. I even find myself kind of appreciating the bombastic symphonic thrash of Master of Puppets. But a lot of other tracks leave a really sour taste in my mouth. Take for instance Fuel and Devil's Dance, which were already pretty fucking cheesy, stupid butt rock numbers. Now they're even worse. They're bombastic. They're over the top. They're so fucking overdramatic. It's almost pretentious. I like that the band was smart enough to recognize that clearly some of their more energetic and brutal material would clearly not work alongside a symphony orchestra, but <sighs> did they really have to pick this much material from Load and Reload? Like, fucking really? I guess I'd give it a two. It's still produced and performed really well, but uh, again, a lot of the material is just really, really, really fucking inconsistent. Although I will say overall, it is actually a better album than SNM2, but we can address that album later, because first, we have to talk about Saint Anger. Oh yes, ladies and gentlemen, we've officially reached that point in the video. Saint Anger, released June 5th, 2003. I fucking hate this album. I hate everything about this album. I I truly do. I really, truly, utterly hate this album. I think it has some of Metallica's dumbest fucking songs, some of their dumbest fucking lyrics, some of their most boring and predictable fucking song craft, their worst fucking production, period. That is not up for debate at all all. It is absolutely caked in grit and noise and static. It's like chewing on the hardened gristle of a well-done steak. It's so tough and unpleasant. Especially those drums. Oh my god. It literally sounds like Lars is banging on fucking trash can lids for the entirety of this album. It's so dumb. It's so edgy to the point of being Truly fucking cringeworthy, especially on the track Frantic. I legitimately have trouble getting through just this one fucking song, let alone the rest of the album. I'll cut the band a little bit of slack. I will spare it from a full-on zero score. I recognize that they were in a very uncomfortable and unhealthy spot as a band in this time. Something that absolutely contributed to the production of this album. But it still very much earns a strong, strong, stanky 0 0.5 out of 5. An utterly insulting fucking record. I fucking hate this album. Truly, with all my fucking heart. It is their worst fucking album. And if you disagree, then you clearly haven't fucking heard it. Next up, we have Death Magnetic, released September 12th, 2008. An album that was billed as the band's comeback album, as their return to form. I will concede that it is objectively better than Saint Anger. It even has a few legitimately catchy and entertaining songs, like All Nightmare Long, Cyanide, and The Day That Never Comes. But my god, it still has a lot of fucking issues. For one... Every single song on this record is way too fucking long. You could very easily trim two to three minutes of fat off of every single track on this album and lose nothing. Not a fucking thing whatsoever. But the biggest obstacle here is that sound mix. This is one of the most atrocious fucking sound mixes I've ever heard on a fucking record. Even on the lowest possible volume, this is such an irritating fucking record. Constantly clipping, caked in static and bullshit. Clearly Metallica have learned very little production-wise from the failures of Saint Anger. 
What makes this all the more disappointing is that this was produced by Rick fucking Rubin, one of the most important producers in all of popular music. Such a fucking shame, honestly. I'd... I'd give it a two out of five. I'll, I'll be nice, because it's got a couple good songs, and I, I think this is definitely an upgrade from Saint Anger, but not to the point where I'd feel comfortable calling this a particularly good record. In fact, I feel pretty comfortable calling this one of the most overrated records, not just in Metallica's discography, but in all of rock and metal music. All right, folks, this is it. The moment you've been waiting for. Lulu, the band's lone collaboration with Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductee Lou Reed, released October 31st, 2011. We're gonna need a drink for this one. We're gonna need a drink. Ah. <coughs> okay. Y'all ready to hear something fucking crazy? Like truly, utterly fucking crazy? Not only do I not hate this album, I think it's actually pretty good. Now before you slam that dislike button, please hear me out. I acknowledge that this is a very problematic record. I acknowledge that it can be very awkward, I acknowledge that it can be very clumsy, and I acknowledge that even in its best moments, it can be pretty pretentious too. And I acknowledge that as a result of all of this, there are parts of this album that are so bad they're kind of hilarious. James Hetfield screaming, I am the table, will literally never not be funny to me. But I believe that even in this album's worst moments, it is still very ambitious, very imaginative, very unpredictable, and perhaps one of the most unique collaborative records that rock music has ever seen. I genuinely kind of love the story and the concept of this album. It tells the tale of a German ballerina. It is based on a play that Lou Reed had tried to write years ago, which itself is based on the works of German artist Frank Wedekind. It's genuinely kind of fascinating to see these two musical worlds collide and when it works, I think it genuinely does fucking work. The track Pumping Blood is a great example. The track Mistress Dread is a great example. I think these are really agonizing fucking cuts thematically and musically. It's got some of the band's most deranged and complicated work of their career. The track Dragon in particular is a very surreal and uneasy track, constantly building tension on top of a very angular, noisy, and uncomfortable riff. Lou Reed's very surreal and bizarre spoken word poetry add a dimension of insanity to this music that Metallica could not have possibly accomplished on their own. I like that the album is recorded in a live setting done literally in one take. It makes it feel very raw, very organic, very authentic. I would argue it's one of the band's best produced records ever if we're being entirely honest. Like if we're just talking production value, this thing's incredible. And I think it ends on one of the band's most emotionally cathartic cuts ever, Junior Dad. I mean, this thing is an absolute tearjerker, an agonizing, heart-wrenching, fucking monster of a track. Lou's vocals on this track are just so moving. They reach down into the fucking black, dark pit of my heart. He sings with so much sincerity and compassion and conviction, almost as if he knows He's going to fucking die soon. Yeah, shoot me, guys. I I like this album, and to be entirely honest, I think a lot of you just shat on it because you were, for whatever reason, expecting a more traditional Metallica release. I'd give it a 3.5 out of 5. It's got some stupid fucking moments for sure, but when it shines, it shines fucking bright, and it showcases Metallica at their most inventive and imaginative point maybe ever. And honestly, real talk, what a ballsy fucking move. Like, do you think Slayer would have the balls to go and make a record with Lou Reed, or Anthrax, or Megadeth, or Mayhem, or Judas Priest, or Ozzy Osbourne, or Cannibal Corpse? Fuck no. But Metallica had the balls to go do it. They had the fucking drive and the freedom to say, fuck it. We don't give a fuck what anyone thinks because we want to do this. Lou's got a really cool idea for an album. He's a fucking rock and roll icon. Let's do it. Who gives a fuck what anyone has to say? I admire the fuck out of that.
go ahead, call me a hipster, a poser, whatever makes you feel better. It's not going to change the fact that I genuinely kind of like this record, warts and all. Next up, we have Hardwired to Self-Destruct, released November 18th, 2016. This is the band's most recent studio album, and it's... It's, it's pretty good. It's, it's, um, it's all right. It's definitely still got some issues. Uh, for one, it's very clear to me at this point that Metallica really aren't capable of editing their own material. They're still including far too many songs, making the album far longer than it needs to be. They're still showing that they don't know how to trim their own songs, how to edit their own songs, how to say, hey, this doesn't need to be here. As a result, there is a lot of filler material on this record. The latter half of this album in particular is loaded with some incredibly forgettable, mediocre, average at best material, including the incredibly drawl and uninspired Murder One. But production-wise, it's all right. Performance-wise, it's all right. And more importantly, there are a lot of pretty solid jams still on this album. The title track, I think, is an especially tight, explosive modern thrash cut. Same goes for Spit Out the Bone. I'm also enjoying some of the more traditional hard rock and heavy metal of Now That We're Dead, Moth Into Flame, and Atlas Rise, the latter of which has a little bit of a Nawabum flair that I think is kind of cool. I even find myself kind of enjoying the alternative rock edge of Am I Savage. I feel like if Faith No More ever tried to make a more straightforward hard rock song, it would sound a little bit like this. I definitely liked this album a lot more when it originally came out. I think I remember even reviewing it and giving it a 3.5 out of 5. Nowadays, I'd feel more comfortable giving it a 3 out of 5, but a legitimately enthusiastic 3 out of 5. It's definitely not on par with Master of Puppets and the Black Album, contrary to what some critics would like to believe, but it is overall a pretty entertaining heavy metal record that shows Metallica doing what they do best, for the most part. And finally, that brings us to SNM2, the band's latest collaboration with the San Francisco Symphony Orchestra, released August 26th earlier this year. I'm not going to spend too much time talking about this album because A, I reviewed it already back in August, and B, I'm tired as fuck. I am simply going to tell you that if I have to pick between SNM1 and SNM2, I'm going to pick SNM1. I stand by all my original criticisms of SNM2. I think the track list is pretty weak. I think the sound mix is shit. I think the performances are really fucking sloppy. There are still some pretty good songs, some pretty good arrangements. I think the orchestral stuff in particular is consistently really good, but Metallica really bring this album down. They, are, they were clearly not in a great mind space when they made this. It's, it's so fucking transparently clear. I'm also going to take this opportunity to upgrade, or rather downgrade, my original score of a 2 out of 5 to a 1.5 out of 5. I just think this is a really poorly put together album. I think it is probably one of Metallica's weakest albums as far as their actual performances are concerned. It makes me genuinely pray and hope that there will never be an SNM 3 because this is fucking bad. This, this just does not fly for me. Not at all. In retrospect, I think I was even too kind in my original review. If you are by chance interested in revisiting that review, I will post the link to that in the description of this video. And that is it. My god, this took a lot longer than I thought it was going to. Holy fucking shit. Now it's your turn. Let me know what you think about Metallica. What's your favorite album from them? What's your least favorite album from them? I think I know what your least favorite album is from them. I, I'm, I'm gonna guess it's Lulu, but hey, maybe it's Reload. Maybe it's Death Magnetic. Maybe it's Kill em All. I don't know. Surprise me. Give me your spicy takes here. If you aren't absolutely infuriated by my somewhat controversial opinion of Lulu, you can press this button right here for more updates on the Metal Meltdown e fuck it immediately. As always, you have yourself a fantastic fucking day.